Hey everyone, Professor Davis here, and we are going to be starting part three and the last part of the nervous system diseases and disorders. So in this particular section, we're going to mostly focus in on brain tumors as well as trauma and some of the rare diseases of the nervous system. All right, so we're gonna start with brain tumors first. When we look at a brain tumor, brain tumors are going to be classified as either primary or secondary. And it is actually very rare for tumors to occur primarily in the brain to start with. A primary tumor is one that originates in the brain. It starts there. And if it originates in the brain, it is normally a benign tumor at first. Benign tumors, however, if they're left untreated in the brain, especially it will metastasize and move to other parts of the body. Most of the time, brain tumors are coming from a secondary source, a different area in the body that has cancer, and some of those cells break off and then develop into a tumor in the brain. So primary tumors are caused, called brain tumors. Secondary tumors are named after their organ of origin. So if it comes from breast cancer, it is still breast cancer, but it has lesions or has metastasized to the brain. That's the distinction between the two. The two most common types of cancers that will actually metastasize to the brain are breast cancer and lung cancer. Now the cause of brain tumors, especially when they're primary tumors, is unknown. We're not sure what causes them to develop or form. But symptoms, whether they are a primary tumor or a secondary tumor, include headaches, vomiting, seizures, changes in mood and personality, especially based on where the tumor may be located, visual disturbances, loss of memory. And one thing about this, guys, is where the tumor is located puts pressure on that particular part of the brain, and that's where we're gonna see symptoms start to develop first. So an individual, if it's located in the frontal lobe, are gonna have more personality changes, they may have impulse control issues and things like that to start with, along with their headaches and nausea and that sort of thing. However, if it's back on the occipital lobe, we're gonna have more visual disturbances that start out first. So it depends on the location of what kind of symptoms we're going to see first. Now, when we talk about brain tumors to diagnose them, we want to do clinical symptoms. So we're going to look at for certain kinds of symptoms that are present due to the pressure that that tumor is putting on the brain. But in order to really make sure that that is what is occurring, we need to do a CT scan, MRI, and then they will do a biopsy. The biopsy will help us determine if it is a primary cancer or sorry, a primary brain tumor or if it is a secondary tumor. Now, treatment. This is a little more difficult based on its location depending on where the tumor is located, if it can be removed, that's what they want to do. They want to surgically go in and remove the tumor and then we'll follow with radiation treatments and chemotherapy. Depending on where the tumor is though, if it is deep in the brain, it may be more difficult to reach and it might be more detrimental for the patient. And so radiation and chemotherapy would be done without surgery. But if the tumor remains, even if we shrink it with radiation and chemotherapy, there is still a high chance that it can cause some major problems for the patient. All right, so the next one we want to look at is trauma. And guys, when we're talking about trauma for the nervous system, this could be any injury that happens to the brain, neck, or spinal cord. Now, the first group we want to talk about are the concussions and contusions. Now, they are in a group together. However, concussions are less serious or severe than contusions. The difference here, though, is the brain has been kind of jolted in both cases, but in a contusion, there's actually physical bruising on the brain tissue, whereas in a concussion, there is not. Okay, so concussion is kind of like the earlier, it's the, the not so severe, whereas contusion is a little more severe here. Now the cause, what causes us to get concussions or contusions? Well, it's a blow to the head, and this blow can come from an object, it could be due to a fall or another type of trauma like automobile accidents, things like that. Now, symptoms. When we're talking about symptoms of either a concussion or a contusion, we see that there is a disruption of normal electrical activity in the brain. This causes the patient to go unconscious. Now, this could last literally for just a few seconds, okay? kind of like where they just were like, it's real quick, in and out, they're back, and they're conscious again, or it could last for several hours. It depends on the severity of the concussion slash contusion. Now this includes also headaches will happen after the fact, as well as blurred vision. Those are the earlier ones. However, we do see that if those symptoms do continue, there's irritability that comes into play. The patient could also end up having where they draw their knees up and begin vomiting in some cases due to that kind of bruising that occurs to the brain. 
Now, contusions can also ultimately lead to other complications like hematomas, where there's actually a blood clot that forms. This blood clot or any kind of swelling that happens in the tissue can increase intracranial pressure. And anytime we increase pressure, that puts damage to the brain tissue. Guys, brain tissue is super delicate, okay? It is very delicate and any kind of pressure to it can um, misshape it and cause damage to that tissue. Um, and this could result in actual permanent brain damage. One of the most common types of injuries is called a coup and counter coup contusion. Now, a coup contusion just means that when you hit, the brain ends up hitting one side of the skull and that's it. That's the coup. But if they have a coup counter coup con concussion or contusion, the brain hits one side and then it bounces back and hits the other. This is with a lot greater force. So it actually damages both sides of the brain. So if you were hit from like behind, it might cause the brain to hit the front and then go back and bounce and hit the back again. Or if you're hit from the side, it might hit where it hits the left side and then comes back and hits the right side. So this can cause some major damage on multiple sides of the brain, depending on the severity of the accident. Now, concussions are a lot bigger deal nowadays. Back when I was in school, played basketball, that sort of thing, concussions weren't looked at as big of, as big of a deal. They still caused a lot of issues for some of us. I've had several concussions playing basketball, but we didn't have trainers checking us out. We didn't have tests that helped look at the concussions and what they did to us early on. Now, students have to take a test and kind of get their level the before concussion. And if they have a concussion, they take the test again. If there's an issue or any discrepancy from what their baseline is, if they then may be held where they can no longer play for a period of time to allow their brain to kind of uh, repair, okay, due to this bruising that may take place. Now, this is a big deal because we do see that concussion after concussion after concussion can actually cause some major issues like something called CTE. CTE is known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Is This is going to be due to a continuous hit and we see this as a big deal in like boxers and football players where they're hit on a regular basis and this coop counter coop can happen without them really realizing it and we do see that it is it, it, a brain of somebody who has CTE is very similar to the brain of somebody who has Alzheimer's. There's a deterioration of the actual brain atrophy that occurs and it causes lots of different changes in the person's personality and um, their uh, cognitive abilities. So when we look at diagnosis, there can be a history of injury, neurological examination needs to be done, cranial x-rays, CT scans, and MRIs. Treatment for concussions and contusions are going to be bed rest, direct observation. Individuals should be checked on every two to four hours to make sure that things are okay. Monitoring of changes of their consciousness. We need to see if that if we talk to them, are they able to talk back to us? Do they end up going unconscious? Are their pupil sizes changing? Does their mood or behavior change during that time they're being monitored? They also may need some analgesics, stimulants, or sedatives depending on what's happening with that particular patient. So in some cases, they may need a stimulant to bring them to because they're kind of real drowsy. On other times, they may need a sedative because they're being overreactive or irritable. Medications may mask symptoms, and we have to be very careful with them to make sure that we have a proper assessment of that particular patient. The next injury we want to look at is a skull fracture. Now, skull fractures can also be an advancement of a contusion or concussion. So you can still have a contusion or concussion, but also have a fractured skull that could result based on it being more severe where the skull is compromised. This is a break in the cranial bones or the skull bones, and it's greatest danger if the brain tissue gets damaged due to the bony fragments. And so when a lot of times there is a skull fracture, they normally break into pieces. And if those pieces get into the brain and cause hairs or because they're rough, sharp pieces, they can end up cutting the brain. With this, it could also sever blood vessels that are part of that meninges area, and it could cause a hematoma, which we'll talk about in a minute. That's a blood clot. Now, brain damage may be temporary or permanent when it comes to a skull fracture, and a lot of it depends on how quickly we get the pressure off and we can correct the issue. Now, there's a variety of symptoms depending on the location of the fracture. If the fracture is near the base of the skull, like where it enters the neck area, it may cause impaired breathing, and that can actually lead to death very quickly. This is where a lot of times if they have a fractured neck as well as the base of the skull, the brainstem could be affected, which has our respiratory um, centers and our cardiovascular centers present. 
We also see that there could be hemiparesis that can take place, seizures, and even infection because we're breaking open an area where then a bacteria or other invaders could potentially get into the brain tissue. Treatment, it depends on the type and the position of the fracture. We might need to do a craniotomy, which is a surgery where they go in and they can correct the issue. They may end up putting a plate in, doing some debridement and taking the pieces of bone out um, to help relieve the intracranial pressure. There may need to be protective headgear that's worn until the fracture is healed because it is an opening and it puts more risk. It just like a baby soft spot puts more of a risk for them. It would be similar to that. We'd want to protect that area. Now, going back to what we saw as something that could be a complication of a skull fracture is something called a hematoma. Now, a hematoma is going to be where it's a collection of blood, like a blood clot in an area due to a bleed. And there's two main types of these hematomas. One is called an epidural hematoma. Epidermal hematomas are collection of blood between the bony skull and the dura mater, which is the outermost layer of your meninges. And so if you'll recall, the meninges are a protective covering around the brain, but they have three layers. The outer layer is called the dura mater. The middle layer is called the arachnoid mater because it kind of looks like spider webs. And then the area or the, the layer that actually touches the brain tissue is called the pia mater. And so this is going to be between the skull and that outermost layer and there'll be a collection of blood there. On the other hand, a subdural hematoma is going to be a collection of blood below the dura mater because sub means below, dural means dura. And so it's below the dura mater between the dura and the arachnoid. Okay, now subdermal hematomas occur twice more often than epidermal. So subdermal are a lot more common than epidermal hematomas. Now we're going to look at both, but if you look at the picture, either one of these, it does cause pressure to happen and it compresses whatever part of the brain tissue that the hematoma is next to. Now this is a chain reaction. It's almost like a domino effect. When I put pressure on this side, it in turn puts pressure here and here and here and here. And so it cascades the symptoms if we cannot get that pressure relieved. So for our first one, the epidermal hematoma, the cause is usually a result of like a fight or an accident. The blood vessels do rupture and a hemorrhage, meaning there's bleeding that takes place. And this bleeding is pretty rapid. We actually see symptoms within a couple of hours. Now this is key because in the subdermal hematoma, there's a big difference here. It's a lot slower. So here we can see symptoms develop within hours after the injury. These symptoms usually occur, like I said, within hours, and they include things like headaches, dilated pupils, okay, where the pupils are very large, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. As the hematoma continues to grow, it increases intracranial pressure, causing other things, depending on which part of the brain is getting the pressure first. It might be personality issues. It might be vision issues, hearing issues. They may not be able to speak properly. So whatever the area that's being compressed, that might be the type of symptom that we see. Now, on the subdermal hematoma, the cause is usually a result of a head hitting a stationary object, kind of like if you fall and you hit your head on the floor, okay, the floor was stationary, you were the one moving. Now, these blood vessels do rupture as well, and blood seeps out, but it's usually going to take days, because it's a lot slower, before you actually see symptoms, okay, so they can end up going to the doctor, getting checked out, seem to be fine, and then a couple of days later, we start to see lots of symptoms that occur, okay, this is kind of like a, a, constant drip of like a sink. So when we look at this, the first one's going to deal mostly like with the arteries and it bleeds out a lot faster, kind of like if there was a break in your pipe and it's flooding the area. Okay. Whereas a subdermal hematoma is going to be that leak in your sink or your tub that ultimately, if you were to collect that water, it would be a huge amount over time. It increases your water bill through that month. But because it was a slow leak, you didn't notice it at first. Okay, it took a longer period of time. Now, symptoms here are going to be hemiparesis, nausea and vomiting, dizziness, convulsions, and eventually the patient would lose consciousness. Now, it doesn't matter which type of hematoma we're talking about. Diagnosis is very similar. Cerebral hematomas are going to be made doing a clinical history. We will do a cranial x-ray, a CT, or an MRI to look for a collection of blood, okay, of an active bleed that's taking place. Now, the treatment. The main treatment is to get that cranial pressure off, okay? So we want to decrease that cranial pressure. And one way to do this is they could do a special type of craniotomy where they do burrow holes, where they burrow little holes in the brain that releases that pressure so that it can drain. The blood can drain, the fluid can drain, and it gives a relief 
to the patient. They can also go in and electrically cauterize the vessels that are bleeding. Okay, so they go in, they cauterize them so that it can hopefully stop that bleeding. And then again, repair can start happening by the body. Okay, and if we can, if we can decrease the pressure, then the damage may only be short term in that case. Now, moving out of the head area, area for traumas, let's move down into the spinal cord. With spinal cord injuries, these usually result when the bony spinal column has been injured or fractured, and that puts the spinal cord that runs through it at risk. Okay, so the spinal cord running through that bony structure becomes at risk if there's a break or an injury to that bony column. Now, the area that's the most vulnerable is obviously the neck region. There's less structures that help protect the neck versus a lot of the structures in your back. Now, causes of spinal cord injuries are going to be things like automobile accidents. They're the leading cause. There could also be gunshot wounds as well as knife wounds. Falls and different sports injuries could also play a role. Now, what are the symptoms of a spinal cord injury? Well, it varies and it depends on the location in the spine. Okay, so if we're talking about up here at the top part of the spine, C1 through C3, the very top part, again, by the base of the skull, those are usually fatal because they take out the brain stem, which we talked about previously, that has the respiratory center and your cardiovascular center present. Okay, so those normally are fatal. When we get down a little bit further, okay, maybe into below C3, into the upper T's, we see that this could cause the individual to be quadriplegic. This is a loss of movement and feeling in the trunk and all four extremities. Quadra means four, and so it's all four extremities are affected. This does cause the patient to lose control of their bowels, bladder, and even sexual function, as well as if it's a very severe, like high injury, there could also be respiratory ventilation issues, meaning the nerves that go and talk to the diaphragm and the muscles for breathing could be hindered. Now, this one is one, though, that they, would, they could survive with a type of ventilator that's present in order for them to be able to continue to, to live. Now, paraplegia is going to be when the accident is lower in the spinal cord, more in the low T's and the lumbar region in the low back. This could be loss of movement or filling in the trunk and both legs. So they tend to have movement of the arms, filling of the arms, and they can use them. But they still could have loss of bowel, bladder, and sexual function because it's any time where the injury is, it's anything below it that's going to struggle. Okay, so anything below that level of injury is going to be affected where the spinal cord's not sending signals like it should. So here's just a basic picture that kind of shows you some of the more typical types of injuries going from like falling off of a horse, also by diving. That's why they have signs on those pools when it's a, uh, a very not very deep pool because you can actually end up breaking your neck or back if you dive into a shallow water. Certain kinds of falls, of course, motor vehicle accidents. We see sports injuries, home accidents, and even if something falls or compresses on you, okay, it kind of crushes you in a sense. Now, again, depending on which level, so you see this, the cervical are in the green, the thoracic are in the orange, and the lumbar are in like that yellowish color. It depends on the location of what kind of symptoms we're going to have. Anything below that point will be affected. So how do we diagnose a spinal cord injury? Well, we're going to do a history of the injury, neurological exam. The neurological exam is going to take into account sensations and movement of the limbs as well as potentially filling, okay, in the sense of can you even feel this? Can you feel the pinprick? That sort of thing. We could also look for swelling, neck, back. We will want to do a spinal x-ray and CT scan or maybe even an MRI. Emergency treatment. Now, if a neck or back injury is suspected, we want to um, treat it immediately, but we do not want to move the individual unless the surroundings are unsafe, okay? We want them to stay still and we wanna wait until they have a neck brace on and a backboard on before we move them. Now, of course, if the area is super unsafe and further injury or even death could occur, we need to get the patient out of that area and then stabilize them. So it depends on the circumstances. Now, once we get them on that backboard and and get that collar on them, we then want to transport them to the hospital where we can do more 
of the treatments. When we look at this type of treatment, we would want to maybe realign and stabilize the bony spinal column if it's actually broken. We want to decompress or release any pressure that's on the spinal cord because sometimes their, their symptoms are due to what we call spinal shock, where the spinal cord is inflamed. And if we can get the pressure off of it, it can go back and we see feeling and function start to return sometimes that the spinal cord wasn't injured permanently. However, we also want to prevent any further injury to occur, to occur to the spinal cord. After all of that has happened and we see stability back in the spinal column, the patient may need to have physical therapy or other types of treatments to help them understand how to continue to live their life. They may need ventilators. They may need a special computer type programs, wheelchairs, assistive devices. So these are just different things depending on the severity of the spinal cord injury. All right, our last group of diseases we want to talk about are the rare diseases. Now, um, some of these diseases are the ones you hear about, like in the media and things like that, due to the fact of sometimes wanting to raise money to try to help individuals with these types of disorders, but they are relatively rare. And this is some... This is part of the reason why sometimes they don't get a lot of funding. When you think about it, there's a lot of funding out there for cancer because lots of people deal with cancer. I mean, you could probably think of a number of people in your life that have dealt with cancer. Now, when we talk about some of these diseases, you're like, I don't really know anybody who's ever dealt with them. And so because of that, sometimes research and the money needed for research is not available. And so they bring awareness to them in different ways. One such illness is what we call amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. You would know it as ALS. ALS went through with the ice water or the ice bucket challenge a while back on social media, where you dump a, a bucket of ice water on you in order to bring awareness to ALS. Now, this is known as Lou Gehrig's disease, and the reason the ice bucket challenge was put into place is because individuals with ALS have destructive diseases of their motor or movement neurons. They do not have an issue with their sensory neurons, and so because of this, they still feel lots of pain and things like that, but they may not be able to move like a normal individual, and that's what pouring ice water does to you. When you pour ice water, it almost shocks your body into not being able to kind of move, but you have the pain of that ice water on you. It's to try to give you an idea of what they might deal with on a daily basis. Now, what happens here is those motor neurons start to deteriorate. Therefore, they do not communicate with the muscles. So the muscles start to atrophy. They start to get smaller. This leads to progressive loss of the movement, specifically of the hands, then the arms, then the legs. So it's a lot of your fine motor first. This means if fine motor starts to be affected, they start to have difficulty with everyday activities like feeding themselves, dressing themselves. Eventually it progresses to where they have a hard time talking, chewing, and even breathing because those muscles are going to start to atrophy. Now, there is no cure for this. And so because of this, supportive treatments are what's used to help the individual. But guys, again, that's to note, there's no sensory losses here. It's only motor or movement that's affected. And there's no mental issues that occur. There's no de deterioration of their mental status. They're just stuck in a body that no longer works. Okay. And this is part of that problem. Now it is normally fatal within four to six years after diagnosis. However, in some rare cases, individuals can live and be very active for 10 to 20 years after their diagnosis. It just depends, but most common it's four to six years. The next one we want to look at is Guillain-Barre syndrome. This is an acute progressive disease that affects the spinal nerves. And it normally begins about 10 to 21 days after you've had some sort of febrile illness. Now, there's a trigger to this. A lot of times it might be triggered by some sort of viral infection you have, especially if it's respiratory or a bacterial infection that's gastroenteritis, like causing issues in your gastrointestinal. And we do feel like the immune system is part of this. So the immune system fights off the illness that you had, and then it decides to then continue to, to fight, even though the invader's gone. So it starts actually demyelinating, it starts to break down the myelin sheath of your nerves, causing the symptoms that include nausea, fever, and malaise. The problem is, is that if it continues to break this down within about 24 to 72 hours, you start to have what we call parathesis, which is where you have this tingling and pins and needles fill and the numbness of your extremities, muscle weakness, and then paralysis usually begins. Now this paralysis normally begins in the legs and starts to work its way up. 
Now, they can progress symptom-wise for several days to weeks. And once the progression stops, though, recovery begins. Because it's like the immune system decided, oh, I'm done. I'm not going to attack the nerves anymore. And the nerves can then start to remyelinate. Those are special cells called swan cells that do that and remyelinate your peripheral nerves. Now, supportive treatment is obviously important because if the nerves communicating with the diaphragm are affected, breathing will be affected and they would need that help during this recovery time. Now, usually recovery is complete, but it could take up to 12 months for full recovery to occur. So this is normally like a temporary issue with the demyelination of your nerves. So this one's temporary. Another one we'll talk about in a minute is the demyelination of the nerves that is more permanent. But before we get to that one, let's talk about Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is known as Huntington's chorea, and this is an inherited disease, and it is an inherited dominant disease, which means if a parent has it, there's a 50% chance that they passed it on to their kids. That's a fairly high chance. And the problem is, is this disease, its symptoms do not appear until middle age, and that's normally after you've already had children. So you may have already passed this on to your kids. This is a progressive degenerative disease of the brain, and it does lead to mental de uh, deterioration. It leads to a type of dementia that does occur. Before that point, though, the patient starts to lose muscle control, and we call that chorea. Chorea is going to be these dance-like movements that occur over and over again, and they're uncontrolled. The patient cannot control those movements that are happening, and it happens in their arms, their head, different areas. We start to see they will develop changes in their mood and personality as well as behavior due to that deterioration of the brain, just like we saw in patients with any other kind of dementia or Alzheimer's. And there is obviously then a loss of memory and dementia. There's no cure for Huntington's either, and we're just going to support the patient as they go through this. But eventually they forget how to learn. They forget how to do everything. They no longer can walk. They no longer can talk. They no longer can feed themselves. Eventually they learn. They forget how to swallow and even potentially breathe, just like we saw in Alzheimer's patients. The next one is multiple sclerosis, also known as MS. The causes here are demyelination, not of the peripheral nervous system, like we saw in Guillain-Barre syndrome, but in the central nervous system, in the actual brain. This allows information because the insulation is going to um, help the electrical signal move in one direction. If the insulation is gone due to demyelination, the information leaks out of the nerve pathway. And so transmission is, is affected. Kind of like when you lose your signal on your cell phone when, when reception is bad. The same thing is happening here where the nerve is trying to sing the signal, but it kind of is sparking out. It's like a short and it doesn't get where it needs to go. Now, this one right here, there could be a genetic component. There is definitely an autoimmune issue, but we don't know if it's triggered by viral infections or things like we saw with Guillain-Barre. They could be, but we're not exactly sure the underlining cause of why this occurs. The problem here though is that it doesn't just demyelinate the nerve. It kills the oligodendrocytes in your central nervous system who are responsible for making the myelin. So even if we were able to get those immune cells under control, the oligodendrocytes are dead. So they cannot go ahead and rewrap the nerves like we saw in Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now symptoms, we see muscle weakness and lack of coordination starts to happen. They will have the parathesis where that's tingling and numbness, speech difficulty, loss of bladder function, visual disturbances, especially double vision called diplopia. This does affect individuals between the ages of 20 and 40. So it happens pretty young. They do end up over the first few years of being diagnosed, they have periods of remission where they feel better and things seem to be working better versus exacerbation where they have extreme difficulties occurring with their coordination muscle weakness. Treatment is going to be physical therapy. Um, there is no cure for multiple sclerosis. And so we're going to try to keep their muscles as strong as possible. We're we'll trying to get those nerves to communicate the best we can. They may need to take muscle relaxants, and this is to help maintain muscle tone and reduce spastic movements because they can also have, when we talk about paralysis, that could be flaccid paralysis where like it just drops. Or there can be spastic paralysis where everything is drawn in and tight. And we want to then be able to release that so the muscles can actually be functional and work. Last but not least, the nervous system, we need to talk about some effects of aging. 
as we age, the nervous system does start to have decreased activity. This occurs in the brain and the spinal cord. And so because of this, we start to first see that no matter if you have no other issues, you don't have any of the things we've talked about with like dementia, Alzheimer's, things like that, you will eventually start to lose your short term memory. Okay, it is an aging process that this happens. You will also start to lose your visual acuity. Guys, your eyesight starts to decrease by the time you're age of 30 and it just continues to decrease. Okay, especially your close up vision. That's, that's why individuals have to like move the paper in and out to find that sweet spot to be able to read it. Okay, that's due to that visual acuity. And especially your peripheral vision starts to be affected. We also see that the ears deafness starts to occur in the elderly as well. And those are all sensory type of issues. Um, as you age, your sleep patterns also get disrupted. They don't sleep as good at night and they nap more during the day. These types of things all will hinder your mental acuity and your ability to react to different situations like with your reflexes and stuff. There obviously could be some of those other things we talked about with dementia or even Alzheimer's that can also occur as you age. Now, there have been some proven things that if you keep your mind active by doing puzzles or doing different things where activities where the brain is used on a regular basis, it can slow down some of these aging issues, okay? It doesn't mean that it stops them. It just slows them down for a little while, making it to where your activity of the brain is still going to be working better than somebody who has not been using those kind of brain teasers and things like that. So this finishes up our lecture over the nervous system and it finishes up all three parts. So there are three parts to this particular lecture. But if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Mm -hmm.